In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. No man, when he has lighted a candle, puts it under a vessel or under the bed. These are the words, the so-called parable, very short parable, of course, of the lampstand that our Lord speaks in this morning's Gospel. And they are meant, as, you, as they might strike you, to be somewhat comical, somewhat amusing. Of course, in our day and age, when we have electric light at the flick of a switch, it's perhaps less impressive. But you have to remember that in most times throughout human history, the lighting of the evening lamp is a significant event. We actually have the, the, the kind of capturing of that moment in our evening Vesper service, every day of the church year. We gather together as the sun sets, and a great deal is made over lighting lamps, the so-called lamp lighting songs, where it culminates in that great hymn where Christ is hailed in O gladsome light as the very light of the world. Just as we gather together, we light that light, we set it in the midst of the church, we hymn Christ himself as the light of the world. But in every home, in every hearth, that is what would happen in the evening. As darkness drew in, there wouldn't be a great number of, of lamps available, but one would be brought certainly into the midst of where everybody was. They would light that with great solemnity and set it up for people to see. And our Lord today says to those gathered around him, well, nobody's going to do that, and then immediately plunge it beneath some kind of vessel or put it under the bed so that nobody sees it. And of course, this is so obvious that it doesn't need saying. You can just sort of imagine the people around them looking at each other thinking, what's the catch, you know? What have we missed here? Usually there's something here that, that kind of gets us to think. Well, in fact, it's so obvious, right? The Lord is impressing upon us that you simply would not be sane if you did otherwise. And yet, set within the context of what our Lord is saying through this whole chapter in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 8, it begins to become a little bit of a catch for us because we realize what light it is of which the Lord is speaking. The whole chapter begins with the Lord who goes out preaching the word in towns and villages. And that it says, in fact, that, that certain people were gathered to him, specifically certain women who came and followed after him as a result. And following that, he preaches his famous parable of the soils, the four soils, right? Where the word goes out and is spread somewhat profligately, right, with abandon throughout the world. The word of God is spread, and yet it isn't always received in the same way. In some cases, it falls where it will just be snatched away by the birds. It doesn't fall on soil at all. Nothing is there to receive the word. In other cases, it falls where there are rocks and there's no pl place for that seed to, to take root. In other places, it will start to grow in soil, but it grows up amidst thorns. And only sometimes does it fall in fertile soil where there are no rocks and there are no thorns and other weeds to grow up alongside it. And there, the Lord has said, this is where that seed bears fruit to great abundance. And following that parable, this parable about how we receive the word, how we hear, and how it is that we're, we're to make use of that word. The Lord tells this very obvious parable about the light. So the light here isn't, it's not your faith or my faith. You know that famous 
song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, and so forth. The, the, the light isn't that. It actually is in the context of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of St. Matthew. There, the, this same parable is deployed differently, right? It becomes, you know, we are salt of the earth, you are the light in the world, let your light shine before others. Here it's not our light. The light is that word which goes forth, which we are to receive. And how do we receive it? Well, we receive it like the evening lamp. You know, if somebody brings the lamp in, we don't immediately plunge it into darkness or hide it or put it away or ignore it. But rather, we receive that light. We receive that light, which is the word of God himself. And we allow that to work on us, to work within us. We allow that to be heard in order that we can truly receive it and live it and proclaim it. The Lord says that this light which comes is going to make everything which is hidden to be revealed, right? And in some sense, this is a kind of end times, eschatological, second judgment kind of reference. But it's not merely that. It happens as soon as it comes. That's when the light begins to disperse the darkness. If we truly hear the word of God, then already that light is at work within us, revealing the hidden things, not only within us, but within the world and revealing the hidden mysteries of God himself, which we see in the Gospel of Luke, are leading ultimately to the cross and to our Lord's resurrection. Well, this theme of hearing, truly hearing, it's accented by what happens immediately afterwards, because of course, in the great crowd and press, there's another scene, and that is that the mother of Jesus and his brothers come and they want to speak to him, quite urgently, it appears. And it's not said here in Luke, as it does in Mark, that his mother and his brothers are a little bit worried that he's out of his mind, or beside himself, literally, uh, in the Greek, beside himself. But clearly, in this context, you, know, you don't arrive kind of en masse as a family to speak to someone in a kind of public environment like this if it wasn't just some kind of intervention, right? This is them trying to look out for Jesus. And what has given rise to this concern? Well, we don't know. He's, he's left his family, of course. He's gone off traipsing around the countryside. Maybe they've heard about some of the things he said. A little bit worried about that. They've heard about what other people are saying about him, right? This is causing some concern. But here we have this intervention. Right? The family is coming, we need to sort him out, right? bring him back to himself. And the Lord Jesus, not speaking to them directly, because of course they're the other side of the crowd, but to those who tell him about them, again emphasizes this theme of hearing. He says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it who hear the word of God and do it, who truly receive this word as light, who allow that light to reveal the truth uh, and to dispel the darkness, and who therefore go and do that word. Do you know, it's significant. This past week, we celebrated, of course, the feast of one of the Lord's brothers, his eldest brother, James. Right? First Bishop of Jerusalem. You can imagine him there at this scene, right? And maybe even being told what the Lord had said, though, that those who are his brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Famously in his own epistle, of course, that is the theme. That you can't just hear the word of God, you can't just think it, you can't just believe it in some sense, but you must also do it. In the first chapter of St. James's epistle, he says this even, if you hear the word of God, but you don't do it, right? If you hear it and don't do it, then it's like as if a man came and looked at himself in the mirror, right? And beheld his face. 
And then as soon as he went away from that mirror, he completely forgot how he looked, completely forgot what he saw in that mirror. What a fascinating image that is, that if we hear the word of God, we, in some sense, are looking into a mirror. When the word of God is opened to us, for example, in the liturgy of the church, when we come here is where the word of God is proclaimed in the scriptures, in the hymns, in the sermon, in all of the beautiful liturgy that we have. The word of God is open to us and proclaimed to us. And how do we receive that? Well, according to St. James, it should be like we're standing looking into a mirror. The word of God, it says in Hebrews, is, is alive and piercing. It cuts to the heart. It cuts between the, the soul and the spirit, between joints and marrow. It reveals things, right? It's like a double-edged sword. That's how the word of God comes to us. And it comes and it opens and it lightens and it reveals like a mirror to us our true nature and that our true place within God's story, within God's kingdom. And that's how the word of God works on us if we hear it. And if we don't hear it and then go and do it, it's like we've seen into that mirror and yet we just walk away and forget completely what it is we've seen. It's a, it's a sobering image. It'd be like, I don't know, maybe lighting a lamp and then hiding it, right? Or something as ridiculous as that. And yet how often, you know, as comical an image as that is, do we do precisely that, right? We come, we experience, we hear the word of God, we enter into and immerse ourselves in that word, and that word cuts us, opens us up, allows us to see and lightens the deepest parts of our hearts and our lives, gives us direction and purpose, and yet we emerge from this place and snuff it out. You know, we place it under that vessel or under the bed. You know, maybe even thinking, well, we'll look after it somehow, we'll, we'll save it against a rainy day or, or whatever. But it, in fact, doesn't go anywhere. It might not have come to us in the first place. Let us heed St. James, who clearly learned something from this episode, you know, hanging out at the, the periphery, you know, maybe trading initially on, well, he's my brother, don't you know, or, you know, I, I'm related to this one, and, you know, maybe some of this will rub off, and realizing actually it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with kinship or with prior affiliation or even what we think of as our membership in some sort of global Orthodox church of some kind. It's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with hearing that word, truly hearing it, allowing it to pierce us, allowing it to lighten us, and, in, and going and doing that, and living that, and proclaiming that. And let us remember that, that we carry forward from this place our, sel our souls, ourselves transformed, and let us carry forward that which we saw depicted in the mirror to us, which is our true nature. We come here and we are revealed to us is our true self. And our real problem out in the world isn't so much that we, we go away from God or that he's distant from us, because God is always closer to us than our own breath. It's rather that we go out from here and alienate ourselves from our true self, our true self that was revealed here, our true self which is us in the kingdom of God. And when we go out, we don't abandon God necessarily because we can't do that, he's always with us. But we abandon ourself. We forget that image, as St. James says, the word that was proclaimed to us that showed us who we truly are. And that's the one we're alienated from. That's the one we lose. And when we come back here, we come back to that self. 
And we must continue to do so until those things come together. The, the one we are in the world and the one we are in liturgy become one. And that is what it means to live, to hear the word of God and to do it. To see that image of us, which is an icon, an icon of Christ himself, is what we see in that mirror. And that's what it means to have been, to have truly heard the word of God and to do it by the prayers of the brother of the Lord, both according to the flesh and according to hearing the word of God and doing it. St. James, whom we commemorated this past week, may we always remember this and light that light and not snuff it out. Amen.